Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for attending our Low and Growth Training Academy webinar. The topic of today's webinar is the differences between radiographic testing and phase array ultrasonic testing. This is Parrish Fur. For those that might not know me, I'm the principal level three and director of quality for low and growth inspection. A couple things before we get into the material. Uh, first of all, all attendees are in listen only mode. So with that said, if you have any questions that come to mind during or after the presentation, please uh, feel free to enter them into the, there should be a questions tab or that you can use the chat tab and I'll get to those at the end. Before we get into things, uh, there's a couple polls that I'd like to send out today just to kind of gauge the audience, see who we're dealing with. I'm gonna send out the first one now, if you don't mind, uh, just answer it at your quickest convenience. All right, so with that, we've got um, at least some that are familiar with both techniques or methods. Uh, some neither, and then some only radiography. So good to know. So just kind of get a feel uh, for who we are talking to here. So let's get into it. Without further ado, uh, again, my name is Paris Fur. My contact information is here uh, in case any questions come up now or after the presentation. And uh, I'll have it at the end too as well. So what uh, we want to accomplish today is to provide a basic understanding of both technologies, explain why it truly is apples versus oranges, and it's, uh, we there is some comparison data at the end uh, to show you why that is. Make sure that you have a better, hopefully, understanding, you have a better understanding of where to apply it, how to apply it, what's best for certain situations, and also break some misconceptions just relating to the technology and. One of the first part, points to the misconception aspect is the key point that I have at the bottom here. And uh, the reality is there is no one NDT method or technique that's best for everything. All of them have their strengths and all of them have weaknesses. Um, there's a misconception that radiography can see everything or face ray should be able to see everything. And the reality is they don't. Uh, again, they're, they're, they both have uh, strengths and both have weaknesses. So here's kind of the outline that we put together for today. Uh, I'm going to do a brief overview of both technologies, just how they work, how they function, what they're good for. Uh, we're going to look at some new fabrication applications, some in-service applications, and some comparisons at the end. So starting with radiographic testing, uh, the first thing I want to make sure that everybody has a good grasp on is there's three common techniques. There's actually a fourth computed tomography that I didn't list because it's pretty rare. Um, but three common techniques that we'll talk through. Uh, they're listed in order of, uh, so radiographic testing is your conventional film radiography. It's what's been done for decades now. Um, and they're kind of listed in order of uh, speed and quality, really. So your film radiography is going to be your slowest but your cheapest. Your digital radiography, and I'll explain the difference between these three in a little bit, um, is going to be your highest quality and your fastest. Computed lies somewhere there in the middle. Computed is really kind of a blend between your film radiography and your digital. So again, we'll go through that a little bit more. But there are these are the three techniques that we're going to kind of focus on today. So the million dollar question, if you're not familiar with radiography, is what is radiation? And radiation is simply a light source or a source of light, however you want to say it. So out of the entire electromagnetic spectrum, the, the visible range is a very small portion of that. On the long wavelength side, you have things like radio waves, microwaves. And on the short wavelength side, you get down here into x-rays and gamma rays, which we'll talk a little bit about here in just a second. But it's a form of light. So when you think of how radiation functions, you, know, you can relate it to how you know light functions visibly. Uh, there's a lot of similarities. 
to perform radiography, we need a, there's a few essential things we need to have. You got to have a source radiation, which we'll review uh, the different source types here in just a second. Um, you also have to have some means of detecting the radiation on the opposite side of the object. We'll go through those as well. Also, processing this image is a necessity, and then you have to have the ability to interpret it, read it once it's done. So, one of the things I want to make sure that is clear, one of the common terms that's thrown around is, hey, I need an x-ray. X-ray is a common slang that's used in the industry, but I want to make sure you understand that x-rays are just one type of radiation. Uh, x-ray machines, when you go to the doctor's office, you, you do indeed get an x-ray. They use x-ray sources. Uh, x-ray sources are common in non-structural testing, but they're usually limited, not always, there's some portable ones, but they're typically limited to lab scenarios, you know, x-ray cabinets. So the function of x-rays and how they're produced, they're, they're artificial, it's artificially produced radiation. So this is uh, an overview of a, of a basic x-ray tube, common x-ray tube. So how it works is you send electricity in, electrons flow across through this vacuum tube, interact with a target material it's a very high dense material and then there's a, a term bremsstrahlung you don't necessarily need to remember that that occurs that when those electrons hit it creates the radiation this is angled down so the radiation is angled down uh, to the bottom in this particular scenario the one of the two of the primary benefits of x-rays is one it can be cut on and cut off so it's not constantly emitting. It's cut on by a switch, cut off by a switch. Also, for a given film or a given detector plate, this is the X radiation is generally going to give you the highest sensitivity uh, compared to the other radiation sources. The most common source of radiation used for field application actually comes from what's called gamma rays. Gamma rays. Uh, it's a pill that I listed three of the most common gamma ray sources. These are essentially rocks or metals in nature. And naturally, they are not radioactive. Their natural state actually has a different element number to them. They are put into a reactor, the nucleus is bombarded with neutrons, and the easiest way I've ever Found to kind of explain them is they essentially tick off the material and it starts to emit energy in the form of light, which is radiation. These are listed, so selenium 75 would be the um, most sensitive, but also the less penetrative. Cobalt 60 is on the other end of the spectrum. Out of these three, it's the most penetrating, but the lowest quality. So the the softer the radiation, if you will which is going to be the less penetrating, it's always going to give you the best sensitivity. Iridium-192 is the most commonly used uh, source type gamma ray source in the field. It's good for materials up to about two, two and a half inches thick. It could go thicker, but uh, it's not really practical. And then cobalt-60, a lot of codes and standards limit it and won't let you use it until you get over around two inches thick and above, just for image quality concerns. So these sources are put into what's called a teal. This is a basic pigtail out of a gamma ray camera. And the way radiation works, or gamma radiation works, so this pigtail with the source, this camera is filled with depleted uranium just as a shielding material, protective, uh, to limit the amount of radiation that is outside of that camera for safety reasons. A drive cable is connected to the end here with a locking mechanism. A guide tube is set up over where the exposure is to be made. Um, this drive cable then drives the pill out to the end. Once it hits the end stop, radiation is constantly emitting, but it's also constantly decaying. Uh, so each of these have half lives, meaning there's a certain amount of time. Iridium-192, for example, is approximately 75 days. Every 75 days, the strength of that radiation source is going to be cut in half. But 
regardless, you drive it out, you make your exposure, you crank it back in, you lock it down, and you move on to your next one. So that's the basic sources of radiation and how the system works. As far as the detectors and processing, uh, we touched on these a minute ago. It's radi radiographic. You see the term, that's your standard industrial film. The film is loaded into lead line cassettes. Uh, it's exposed to radiation. Then the processing is done with chemicals very similar to the old photographic film days. Below probably the age of 20, uh, which I doubt anybody on here is, you probably don't even know what photographic film is. But again, processed with chemicals, uh, the actual film. Computed is kind of a combination between the two. So computed radiography uses flexible imaging plates. So you can do all the same things that you can do with your standard industrial film. Uh, it's a little bit faster though. Uh, your exposure times aren't quite as long as it would be with film. And there is some post-processing things you can do that can help the density and things like that. Processing with computers is done by placing the radiated uh, plates into a reader slash processor. And then that processor is connected to a PC. And the PC is how all the interpretation is done. Digital radiography uses their rigid glass panels and they're directly connected to a PC. So um, the shot times, exposure times for digital radiography is much shorter overall uh, than computed and especially for film. Uh, and with these glass panels, the sensitivity is incredible. However, they are rigid, so that's something you have to take into account. So we're not going to uh, bend for flexing around pipe or things of that nature. By being directly connected, as soon as the exposure is over with, uh, it's directly connected to a computer with computer software designed to process uh, the data. So the digital images can be immediately assessed after the exposure. There's no in-between method of processing necessary from that stage. A couple quick things related to interpretation. Once You've made the exposure, you've developed or processed the image. There's some things that need to be done uh, before you even get to the detection of flaws or disposition, determining if it's good, bad, or ugly. So for example, uh, there's some, and phase array is gonna have some of these same quality checks, uh, or have quality checks, just like uh, we do here in radiography. So some of the things we would look for after an exposure, thing like film density, which we're going to talk about here more in a second, make sure you understand what that is. Looking for um, scratches, exposure to white light, false lead, anything that could prevent you from thoroughly examining or anything that could prevent you from seeing an indication of relevancy would cause for a, a, a new or re-exposure. You're also looking for things like location marker identification, project information, I actually cropped out of here for client proprietary reasons, and image quality indicators, which is how we're gonna judge sensitivity that I'm gonna to touch on here in a second to make sure you're familiar with. As far as density, uh, radiography is a density-based technique, so it's important to understand what density means to us. And density simply relates to how dark or light the image is. Uh, on the bottom here, this is a radiograph of a basic ultrasonic step wave. It's just something where it has variations in thickness. So the way radiation works, uh, the way light works, so the thicker it is, the harder it's going to be for radiation to go through. The less material there is, the easier it's going to be, or more light slash radiation is going to get through. So the film is, it's, it's a negative, right? So the less dense the area, the darker it's going to be. The more dense the area, the lighter it's going to be. An example for like the void here. So air or radiation travels through air a lot easier than it travels through steel. And so the thicker the material, the less radiation is going to pass through. Uh, when I teach classes, I like to use a standard flashlight. Imagine if you had a really thin cotton a uh, piece of material, uh, expose it to the light source, and there's going to be a good amount of light that's going to pass through that you'd see on the other side. 
if you had a thicker piece of material, it's going to absorb more light, meaning less light is going to come out on the other side. So anything you relate to in real life uh, adds and helps with understanding how this works. In addition to the thickness, material density also plays a, a factor in density. So the more dense the material, think of like an ink and nail or a nail, something super dense, uh, super strong materials, it's going to attenuate radiation at a much higher or a higher rate, depending on what the material is, than say a basic soft carbon steel. Uh, that justifies why, if you're familiar with gas tungsten arc welding, that's why we're able to see tungsten inclusions in a TIG weld, because tungsten is more dense, so it gives a light colored indi a lighter indication within the weld. So if you look at uh, again, back to the step wedge, we would consider the light areas low density, the dark areas high density. So this, for example, is graded in a scale from roughly zero up to about 4.8. Uh, it's rare to get densities above 4.8 from my experience. So this might be a one, this might be a two, three, four, just for example purposes. The next thing I want to touch on, hopefully uh, you've got a good grasp of density and, and how that works with radiation and radiography. Next thing I want to touch on is sensitivity. And sensitivity is simply an assessment to assure that you have adequate contrast and then sharpness to see uh, or image falls at essential size or greater. Again, we radiography is number one, like I said earlier, not going to see everything. And then not everything is bad either. So this is governed, uh, especially in the fabrication world, it's governed by code standards and specifications. It'll tell you what the minimum sensitivity is that's needed. You could always be greater in sensitivity, but you can't ever be less than the sensitivity specified. So these are a number of factors that contribute to the overall radiographic sensitivity. I want to highlight just a couple, and one is source type. Touched on this a little bit, but the source type is very important relative to the overall sensitivity that you're going to get. In general speaking, the normal lab x-ray is going to give you higher sensitivity than iridium. Iridium is going to give you higher sensitivity than cobalt. So this would be your least sensitive. This would be your most sensitive. Another thing is film type. There's various film types out there on the market for doing film radiography, uh, different grain sizes. So uh, the slower the film, the higher the sensitivity, the faster the film, the lower the sensitivity. And then lastly, in regards to that, I wanted to kind of highlight two. Uh, this is related to the sharpness. We call it unsharpness, geometric unsharpness to be exact. So imagine uh, if you again, took a flashlight, and I like to do this as well to illustrate this point, but if I put the flashlight, put my hand between the flashlight and the wall, the closer my hand gets to the wall, the more the actual size of the shadow is, is going to represent the actual size of my hand. The further or the closer my hand gets to the light source, you're going to have an expansion or uh, effect that's going to make my hand look larger. It's the same thing with components and testing. So we want our test object to be as close to the detector slash film imaging plate as possible. Sensitivity is measured by the use of image quality indicators, which are also called penetrometers. So if you ever see IQIs or penetrometers, again, it's just a, uh, this is the measurement of how we determine if a radiograph meets the minimum sensitivity or not. And there's two basic types, wire types, which are uh, placed on the area of interest. And there's hole types, which are typically placed adjacent to the area of interest. So it may specify the first wire in this particular set is your minimum sensitivity. So it's part of radiographic interpretation. Make sure that you can see that. Or if you're using a hole, it may say you need to see the 2T hole in this 25 penny or 25 IQI. So you got to make sure that you can clearly, visibly see whatever the uh, sensitivity 
requirements are. So that's the level 116 uh, overview of how radiography works. Let's talk about some applications real quick. Uh, most common uses for radiography, material inspections. I used to shoot a lot of castings back in the day, just looking for inherent discontinuities that occur during the casting process, like shrinkage, hot tears, porosity, things of that nature. Um, and we're going to look at some examples of several of these. Profile radiography is very common. Uh, this is a method using radiography to get an approximate thickness of a material. It's most commonly used for corrosion and insulation applications, where you can't get to it with ultrasonics, you can't get a direct physical measurement, that kind of thing. It can be used uh, for non-CUI as well, uh, things like valve bodies, cast valve bodies that aren't really susceptible to ultrasonic testing uh, very well anyway. Also, just sometimes we're asked just to locate and identify welds under insulation. So this open vision system, uh, we use this sometimes just as simple as just to locate uh, a well of concern without having to remove insulation. Maybe blockage assessments, concern about something blocking a particular line, uh, things of that nature, and then obviously welds. So let's look at a few examples. Material inspection, this is a cast valve. Found some shrinkage in there, common application. Profile radiography, typically used as a ball bearing or some, something of known size. It gives us an approximate thickness here. And I say approximate because it's, it's not going to be exact. It's an estimation, but it's a, it should be a pretty high, fairly high accuracy estimation. Blockage, so in this particular line, there's some packing material that got stuffed in here. Uh, not sure exactly what this line is, but you can see an obstruction within there. So another use, common use of radiography. And then obviously welds, probably the most widely used aspect of radiography. And you can see this is one of our just general test plates here. You can see uh, the density and the, de and the changes in density is what we're looking for. So if, if there's not enough material loss for air to provide a density change, and the chances of you seeing it are slim to none. So you can see the multiple pores of porosity, and the root bead here in the middle, you can see where there's some excess penetration there, so the light spot indicates that to us. A couple of elliptical welds, which is usually reserved to piping roughly three inches and less, smaller diameter piping. And these are digital, uh, all these are digital radiography actually, and you can see how great the sensitivity, there's a hole penetrometer, you can even see the one T hole there. So those the applications, let's talk, I'm going to highlight, I won't read through all of them, just I do want to highlight some pros and cons. We're, we're comparing radiographic testing to phase rays, so that's what the pros and cons are related around. The biggest pros for radiography, and this goes back to kind of a running joke that I have for years, but there's a lot of truth to it. Anybody that's ever been to the doctor's office thinks they're an expert at reading a radiograph. I can't tell you how many arguments, or we'll call them arguments, heavy discussions that I've had in a dark room with a welder or a welding contractor over uh, image interpretation. So it can be good, it can be bad, but yeah, it's easier for people to understand and read which also means that it's easier to audit. As most know, there's many cases to where maybe the client uh, wants to audit it, or maybe there's a third party third party that needs to audit it. So with the familiarity there is with radiography, that, that part is a lot easier. Also, the uh, less technician dependency, as compared to phase array, that is true. It doesn't mean a monkey can come do radiography, it just means with phase rate, there's just more buttons to press, there's more parameters as a whole. So there's not as much of that radiography, which is a pro. The, the, the major cons, uh, number one is it is a radiation hazard. So you're going to have to clear an area. This could potentially lead to some downtime depending on your 
your particular situation. You also have to have access to radiography to both sides of the component. Sometimes that's not always possible. You eliminate the butt welds, T and corners, uh, tight joints, fillet welds could be radiographed. It's just not a common practice and not recommended. And one thing I want to highlight and make sure everybody understands why near the end is you will have a lesser detectability for discontinuities such as cracks and lack of fusion. And it kind of ties into why radiography does not detect laminations because there's not enough density change. So the volume, the plane of the indication of the discontinuity are all important into detection. All right, so hopefully that uh, gives you some good information if you're not familiar with radiography. So let's run through phase array ultrasonics. So question number one is phase array ultrasonics. What is ultrasound? It's simply sound above the human hearing range. So sound, as I've said here in general, is a series of mechanical vibrations. And just like we can relate radiography to light and how we see light, we can also relate what we hear and how sound works in the audible world to how sound works in the ultrasonic world as well. So again, just a series of mechanical vibrations that travel through the material. With any UT technique, there's some basic essentials. We need a source of some type to generate electrical signals and receive electrical signals and be able to process those. We need a cable to transmit those to a transducer. The transducer's job is when the machine sends out an electrical pulse of energy, electrical pulse travels down to a, a crystal or an element. When the electrical signal strikes it, that element distorts or vibrates and creates a mechanical pulse that then travels down through the material. The machine also, so, I mean, back up here. So as the sound wave travels down, the other key principle in ultrasonics is the angle that that sound hits is going to be the same angle that it reflects. So if you drop the ball at zero degrees, it's going to bounce back at zero degrees. Or if you bounce the ball at 45, it's going to bounce off in another direction at 45. So as it's reflected, as sounds reflected off of either the back surface, indications, flaws, whatever it may be, when that mechanical pulse returns, the transducer's job then is to turn that mechanical vibration back into an electrical pulse that can be processed by the machine. The processing, if we know, we know the velocity of sound through particular materials, so we know how fast it travels. And so if we know how fast sound travels and we know how long it took to get there and back, we can make pretty accurate determinations of where it is within the material. All right, and then obviously we've got to have some type of display to read it. So last thing before we get into phase array specifically, I want to make sure you understand that there are, these are the four basic techniques under the ultrasonic method. So conventional ultrasonics have been around for decades. Time of flight diffraction has been around for a while. We're going to go through uh, phase array in pretty good detail. And then we're going to have another uh, webinar in the not too distant future over uh, what I believe is the future of advanced ultrasonic testing, full matrix capture, and the total focusing method. But again, today we're going to focus on phase array. So what is it? If you've been fortunate enough to be a mother or a father, you've probably seen a sonogram. If you're unfortunate to have heart issues, you've probably had an echocardiogram. Uh, so this is a basic sonogram. This isn't my kid, by the way. But one of the first techniques we teach guys in, in our classes is what we call a baby scan. And we call it a baby scan because it looks like your typical sonogram. So this is a negative 30 to a positive 30 degree suite with side drill holes just to help you kind of understand the imagery. So as it sends and receives each signal, it collects that data and puts it into a 2D uh, representation for us. So it is an advanced ultrasonic technique, and all phase rate probes have to have multiple elements. Most commonly used probes have anywhere from 16 to 64, but up to 128. So more
more advanced probes that are coming in the market now even have up to 256 elements or more potentially depending on uh, the, the instrumentation. The important factor of, and the reason we need these multiple elements is we're going to fire numerous elements at a time which will give us the ability to control the direction, a lot of the angle of the beam, and also the shape or the focus of the beam. So in here, let's see if it'll start playing here. Not wanting to cooperate for me, but it's okay. Um, so it works by, we have not only multiple elements, but we also have multiple pulsers, so we can send um, a number of electrical signals at one time, and it's the timing at which those electrical signals hit the transducer is what controls the direction of the beam. If they all hit these elements at the same time, the beam would go straight down. If I wanted to steer it in this direction, I would fire them in this sequence. If I wanted to steer in the other direction, I would fire them in a sequence uh, going opposite of that to get a, um, a sweep of angles. And every time it sends and receives, it's storing the information so that we can present it. There's two basic types of scans. There we go. There's two basic types of scans. Sorry about that. Electronic scans, the first one we'll go over really briefly. Electronic scans are single angle scans. It's electronically rastering across the elements, and every time it sends and receives, it steps over and goes across the whole program. This type of scan is predominantly used for thickness testing, corrosion mapping, looking for uh, base metal indications such as laminations, and in angle beam testing, typically reserved for more heavy wall objects. Sectorial scans are multi-angle scans and the beam steering is simply done by just altering when the timing of those elements are fired. So from one position we can sweep a beam say 40 to 70 degrees at every one degree, every half degree, or if you want to get fancy you could even do every quarter of a degree. So from a single position you get better coverage overall than you would with an electronic scan. And what we know is, especially in, in weld inspection, is that flaws are angular dependent. And it goes back to that reflectivity uh, stuff we were talking about earlier. So I want to hit flaws at the most perpendicular angle of it and it's possible to optimize my ability to get a, a return signal. All right, so those are the two basic scan types. There's others, but we don't want to get too deep into this. Scan planning is a term we use in phase array that uh, if you plan on using it or are using it, you need to be somewhat familiar with. If it's an encoded evaluation or they're storing data or it's code work, uh, there should be a scan plan associated with that particular inspection. By ASME, uh, American Society of Mechanical Engineers, for those that might not be familiar, their definition of a scan plan is a documented inspection strategy to assure adequate coverage and to provide repeatability between multiple or subsequent examinations. So in other words, if you had a bunch of four inch schedule 80 pipe to shoot, you wouldn't want one guy doing it different than another guy and you wouldn't want to do it different on Monday than you did it on Friday. You want to find a good way to do it. You want to be able to repeat that for subsequent examinations. The scan plan should define everything that the operator needs to be able to set it up, uh, evaluate, collect the data, so how many scans, where the, the probes need to be, so on and so forth. After the scan plan is in place, then you can get into system configuration. So these systems are very versatile. Um, we can collect data from one probe, we can collect data from two probes at the same time, and even in a situation like this, uh, more elaborate of a setup, uh, we can, two different probes, and I've got actually two sectorial scans coming out of this probe, two sectorial scans coming out of that probe, and we can collect all that data at the same time as well, just to minimize the number of scans that you have to take. So collect as much as possible, 
to prevent such a scheme. Uh, with that, it fires all these in sequence. So it would fire, say, the first through the last beam here, the first through the last beam there, first through the last beam there, so on and so forth. And each individual beam or angle sent and received independently. So the more angles or the more what we call phone calls that you have, the slower the scan is going to be, the larger the data file is going to be, but the more data that you'll collect at one time. And it's important to note, too, that any uh, scan, let's say, again, there's four in one here, each of these has to be calibrated. And real briefly on calibration, I'm not going to get stuck on this because we can talk about it for longer. But the point of calibration is really threefold. One is to make sure our depth accuracies are good. So in a zero degree technique, we want to be super, super accurate on depth. Because if I'm doing a fitness for service evaluation on a, a tank or a pressure vessel, you know, I need to be uh, very, very accurate. If I'm telling a welder how deep a, a void is that he needs to grind out or gouge out, I don't need to be quite as accurate, but there's a tolerance that I need to make sure that I'm within. So make sure that we are determining accurate depths. Also, that our amplitudes are accurate across all of our the beams that we're producing. And lastly, uh, and most importantly, in my mind, really, uh, along with the depth, is the sensitivity. So the sensitivity establishment or reference level establishment is very important. You can crank enough gain or sound, which uh, comparatively speaking would be like turning up the volume in your car or your truck, you can turn it up so loud you can see just about everything. So there has to be an established baseline for what that sensitivity should be. In the fabrication world, that's determined by the code standard or specification. In the in-service world, in phase array, it's a lot of times determined you, the calibrations are done just on base material. Because in that situation, you want to be a little bit more sensitive because you're generally looking for cracks or something of severe nature. But reference level and the reference uh, level reflector is used as basically a comparator. So in the case of piping, we typically use notches. So you would hit that notch, you would set it to a particular level, depending on what the code said, and then you're comparing everything that you find within the test object to whatever that reference reflector is. So again, there has to be a baseline. You don't want to be out there guessing because we don't want to be oversensitive which would reject more than what was needed and we don't want to be undersensitive obviously and leave things in there that could be detrimental to the component long term data is collected by the use of an encoder the encoding mechanism is designed to track the position of your search units as it moves so that you not only collect all the data but you know positionally where anything that pops up may be for verification or repair purposes. Encoders are typically installed within some type of scanning mechanism, and most of these scanners are application specific. Some are fairly versatile, some are application specific. All these three here, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but let me pop this back up. These three here are technically considered semi-automated because you're manually in all three of these moving the uh, scanner or the encoder, but the system is automatically storing the data as the encoders move, which means it makes it semi-automatic. Uh, we have one of, these are one of our scanners called a Navic. This is more of a fully automated, can be fully automated, operated with a joystick, but you can basically just push the button, tell it to go, put it on track, and it goes. So two basic types of scanners. Scanning speed is a popular question with phase array, and it really does depend on a lot of factors. Uh, most common scan speeds for your basic setups are going to be anywhere from 1 inches per second up to about 10 inches per second, depending on, again, um, the thickness, how many probes, how many focal logs or beams of sound are emitted, and so on. I could keep going, but I'm not. So just to give you an idea, it could be less than that. could even be faster than that depending on what it is. Evaluation, so after we've collected 
So we set up, we calibrated, we collected, now we get to the evaluation stage, which can begin immediately after the inspection is complete on the instrument, or there is post-analysis software that's available uh, so the technicians can evaluate this on their computer as well. And it would take a couple, maybe an hour or two more for me to thoroughly explain all these imaging views. So I'm not going to try for time purposes. If anybody would like any more information on that, I'd be happy to provide that later on. Uh, but here's your basic. These are the four basic imaging views. And then um, in our newest, latest, and greatest instrumentation, we do have 3D capabilities, uh, which makes it easier. It's really just that's more for the client side. It makes it easier for clients to understand. Uh, but in a nutshell, these views are all used in combination with each other. This scan here, a D and other instrumentation, actually all other except for M2 M85, it's called a B scan, but they call it a D scan. This is the primary detection tool. Uh, I'll show you how that works here in just a second. The C scans will measure length and check for data quality. Uh, you can sometimes indications of relevance will stick out here. This S scan is a side view, and it's just one slice of data that's somewhere along the link. And then the A scan is the the true, uh, that's actually what makes up all these other views. This is the, the core source of information that provides all these other views to be formed, which the A scan uh, is just as important with phase array as it is with conventional and any other method or technique within ultrasonics. As far as data interpretation, and not going to go through all these, but very similar to radiography, just want to make the point that when a radiograph or phase array data is collected, there's some quality checks that need to be done before you even get into looking for the discontinuities themselves. So, for example, uh, I, this, I made this scan on purpose just to show what missed data. So if the technician scans too fast, these black lines indicate that the encoder or the search units were moved faster than the system could collect the data. So that would cause us to rescan a particular object. Also, uh, the scan plan dictates that you have to be so far away from the weld itself. We want to prove that up. And in situations like single V, this is uh, like basically a piping joint. If we can find geometric inclusions, we can actually prove that up and make sure that it's within tolerance. That to expect somebody to, to maintain, say, a half inch distance from the center of the weld and be exactly a half inch is unrealistic. So there has to be some tolerances in there, and we have to make sure those tolerances are met. Then after you, you get through all the quality checks, then we can get into fault detection. So fault detection in phase array is done. Uh, we'll scroll through these angles. It's not too dissimilar from radiography in, in, the, in the method of detection. You're looking for consistencies and non-consistencies. So you can see below uh, here, you kind of see the cap of the weld start to come in, and you see the indication sticking out there. So you're looking for consistencies and inconsistencies. We generally just use this scan to detect. Then you move it over. Then we can start looking at what is it, how big is it, how long is it, all that type of stuff. All right, so that's the crash course in the application or how, or how phase array works. Common phase array applications, material inspections. So corrosion mapping, thickness assessments, uh, typically in service. Also in service crack assessments, looking for hydrogen induced cracking or stepwise cracking, fatigue, mechanical, thermal, whatever it may be, stress corrosion, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then obviously new fabrication or in service weld inspection. And one of the pros that we'll see here in a minute is we're not limited in joint types. We can do pretty much any type of joint with phase array ultrasonics. So some examples of common applications. This was from a field application uh, looking for, uh, I think 
think this was actually, they thought they had a corrosion issue. It turned out to be, I had an internal laminar, uh, lamination type indication. So center, roughly center line, a little bit of variability. So easily picks that out. And that's roughly 60, 60 inches in axial length of pipe. And that's the full circumference. So it was roughly about seven o'clock on the pipe. Also, again, in service cracking, this one on the left is another one that uh, I pulled from the field not too awful long ago. This was a through wall crack. It was actually leaking. So you see the cracking, you actually see some branching in here. This is an example of an in service crack that actually stemmed from the root of the weld and started propagating up the fusion face of that particular weldment. So not only with, can we detect cracks with a high degree of precision, the, the height of precision is also inherent in the accuracy. Uh, we can be extremely accurate. And then your weld inspection, uh, just again, another example of a multi-scan, multi-probe uh, data collection on a weld. All right, so last thing on phase ready, let's run through the pros and cons versus RT like we did before. So the major advantage to phase array is going to be a uh, they're, you know, they're apples and oranges. So what's good for RT is generally the bad side for phase array, and the good for phase array is sometimes the bad side, oftentimes the bad side for RT. So the pros here for phase array is there are no radiation hazards, so your downtime uh, is minimal to nil. They just, the water has to get out of the way. It's the only thing so you can inspect the well. You only need access to one side of the component, so if access is limited, then a ultrasonic technique or phase array would be ideal to use. Not limited on joint types, like we already said, and phase array is most sensitive to cracking and fusion type discontinuities. Its weakness is going to be more of the strength of radiography. Uh, as far as the cons, the major con is the interpretation. Unlike radiography, it usually takes some explanation to the client or the third party uh, of how to interpret the, the data. So, which also leads to auditing can be more difficult if the individuals are unexperienced. And you know, we offer training classes to clients to help with that. Uh, some are for it, some not. But you know, but it does oftentimes take some degree of training to get people up to speed. And another aspect of that is we are also responsible to be able to provide software so that the clients or the third parties can read it. So you got to have the software, you got to understand how to use it, interpret it, that type of thing. Um, the other one I want to highlight, and this is from the component design standpoint, with, with phase rate, you've got to have enough room to get the search unit say adjacent to the weld or in the area of interest. So if it's limited access, a lot of fitting to fitting type um, stuff that has minimal uh, distance for the, the search units to sit are gonna be more adequate for radiography than they are for this array. And the other one is pretty typical, um, but those are the, the highlights there. So I want to throw out one more question, at least, to uh, make sure you're not asleep on me. So I'm going to launch one more poll, if you will. Take a minute. Let me know where you sit in regards to new fabrication versus in-service. All right. 
So it looks like the looks like everybody done. So it looks like the majority of you are in new fabrication, and then we have some that are involved with both new fabrication and in service. So it's good to know. Well, uh, actually, while I got your attention, let's do one more. It just kind of ties into it. As far as what industry, what industries do we have represented here? Just so that I don't spend more time on something than I need to. Okay. Just another second or two. All right. I got some structural friends on here. So it looks like oil and gas and structural predominantly. So I appreciate you answering that. Kind of lets me know where to steer my focus here. So as far as the fabrication codes, uh, there's many out there in the market obviously we're not going to go through all of we can't go through all of them but try to highlight the most common fabrication codes and want to look at what can be applied when it can be applied rt versus phase ray just make sure we have a good understanding so section eight is your pressure vessel fabrication code there's two main divisions division one division two in either one of those divisions, uh, the following rules apply to application. So for girth welds and long seams, basically ASME takes the approach that uh, in the old days, prior to advanced ultrasonics, anything that could be RT had to be RT, so any butt welds. Anything that couldn't be RT, UT was allowed. They came out with some code cases in the 90s that are now in the code as mandatory uh, well, they're in the acceptance codes now, which allows the use of phase array in lieu, well, not only phase array, it could be other techniques as well, but automated ultrasonics in lieu of radiography, again, concentrating on phase array. So in the current codes, you can do RT or phase array on any butt joint. However, there are some hurdles that you have to get around to apply phase array. Uh, number one, it requires that if you're going to substitute phase array, it's going to require a demonstration or qualification of the phase array scan plan and technique. The whole purpose is to demonstrate the detectability and the acceptability off of plates with known flaws of known sizes. And these are actually acceptable size flaws. So the theory there is if I can detect and size something that's acceptable, then I can easily find things that are unacceptable or rejectable. Phase Ray also institutes a, an alternative acceptance criteria, and this is due to the known differences between Phase Ray and radiography. So Phase Ray requires pressure mechanics evaluation, uh, which is means of judging a flaw or discontinuity based on its height and length ratio, or aspect ratio as we call it. So rather than tight, so it doesn't matter if it's lack of fusion, slag, porosity, that's irregardless in this scenario. If the height and length exceed a certain ratio, then it's going to be bad. So just some hurdles we have to get around. These qualification blocks, we've actually invested, uh, and it is an investment uh, for pressure vessels. We've got blocks currently from we can do down from a quarter inch all the way up to roughly four and a half inches thick. And my big demonstration blocks weigh quite a bit. All right, so that's for girth wells and long seams. Uh, when you run into repair scenarios, there is a certain allowances for UT of joints when RT can't be performed. And I've listed one example, a closing head might be another example, but the one example I mentioned here that I've ran into several times in my past is the, you know, let's just say that your fabrication facility, uh, you've already put the closing head, you put the two bundles in, and you forgot that there was a repair needed, 
and a long seat. Well, you're not going to be able to re do radiography with the bundles and all that in there, so they allow UT. In any case where UT is allowed, you can substitute phase ray in lieu of UT at any time. And when you do that, it falls under the workmanship criteria, which is where you base the acceptance on the type of flaw, crack, lack of fusion, slag, so on and so forth. Nozzle wells are UT joints. They're not susceptible. I mean, you could do RT on them, but I would never advise it. The image is not going to look good. So they're UT joints, so UT is allowed. And again, anytime UT is allowed, phase array can be used with the workmanship criteria. 31.1, 31 31.3, 31 since we have some oil and gas on the call. Um, obviously, 31.3 is your process piping. 31.1 is your power piping, usually after the first flange of a pressure gun tool. In both cases, uh, well, we'll just start. I won't skip too much. In 31.1, RT or UT can be performed. And again, anytime UT is allowed, case rate can be substituted because all ASME does is refer back to Section 5, Article 4, which phase rate is a mandatory appendix within there. So as long as you follow the rules that it has for it, then you can substitute phase rate for UT at any time. So anything over NPS2, nominal pipe size of 2. There is alternative criteria that the engineer can specify. We, I quite frankly discourage it, but some people uh, like to implement. Same thing with 31.3, there's an alternative criteria there. In 31.3, the same thing, RT or UT slash phase rate can be performed on any pipe size. There's one exception though, the engineer approval is required if you run into severe cyclic connections. So if you have severe cyclic uh, on your project, on your job, that's where you will need to take a step back if you want to apply phase rate but RT is good on everything. And again, the alternative criteria exists. 1104, you can do both. I won't spend too much time on that. And there is some specifics for automated ultrasonics that we have to follow. And um, we encode everything that we can encode. For my structural friends, uh, this was my bread and butter back in the day. Uh, was thrust into the oil and gas eight, ten years ago. But um, D11 is your structural steel. Uh, D11 adopted phase rate as an annex in 2020. It has very little restriction. So you can substitute RT for, or excuse me, substitute phase rate for RT on any butt joints. You can do either technique on butt joints. And you can substitute phase rate for ultrasonics. Uh, at, on any joint at any time. So if, if UT is specified, you can do phase array in lieu of any time. Encoding is required, however, except for in limited or restricted access areas. D15 is your bridge code. It has a few more restrictions. It was adopted in D15 in 2015. 2020 has got some edits, uh, actually on TG4 and an advisor to both of these codes and there's going to be a, some big changes coming in 2025 if they don't put up a um, rata sooner than that. So with that said, in the bridge world, RT is required for all complete joint penetration groove welds if they're subject to calculated tension or, or, or reversal of stresses. However, engineer approval can override that. Um, so just need to be aware if you're in the bridge world. RT or phase rate can be used for all of the butt joints, just like D11, and UT or phase rate can be used for all other T and corner joints, just like D11, and the same thing, encoding is required unless you don't have access. There was a little bit of in-service presence here. There's just a couple slides on the in-service world. Mostly, these are you're mostly you're looking for in-service damage mechanisms, right? So if I'm worried about corrosion, metal loss, thickness loss, UT thickness is still going to provide the most overall accurate results. However, as we've got the bullet points noted here, it is a spot reading, there's minimal coverage, and 
you won't be able to perform any ultrasonic testing if you have insulation, fireproofing, or something on the surface that prevents direct contact from the search unit to the part surface. That's why in insulation, a lot of refineries, plants will put in uh, inspection ports. So there are areas where readings will be taken at certain intervals without having to remove all the insulation. So phaser A in its ideal world is used as a screening tool because the coverage that you'll be able to get, we can map out areas, especially carbon still, very, very fast. And then in the in a perfect world, you go back and prove up, you use phaser A to find the areas of concern in the, the deepest extent, and then you go back and you prove up the UT thickness just to verify and make sure that that truly is. That said, if you, due to the focusing capabilities, the beam steering capabilities, but more the focusing, your accuracy is still going to be very high with phase rate, even if you don't go back with the UT thickness. But again, both ultrasonic techniques require the surface to be fairly clean, fairly smooth. RT profiles, as we touched on briefly earlier, are normally reserved for insulated piping or cast type components like valve bodies, things like that. Uh, but doesn't have to be insulated. Overall, the accuracies are expected to be slightly less than direct contact ultrasonics. I've looked for years for a research paper to, to describe what the accuracies are. There none exist the last time I looked, but just talking to uh, friends, cohorts from the industry, you, know, you should generally expect it to not be quite as accurate because it is a comparative technique we discussed earlier with the ball bearing. If your concern is in-service cracking, UT or ultrasonic, some ultrasonic technique is always going to be the most reliable. So phase ray is one of the preferred techniques. FMC TSM is uh, touched on, which is one of the other techniques is, is really good as well. So if it's cracking, such as stepwise cracking that Hick normally starts off running parallel to the surface, hydrogen blister, and it cracks out. It's called stepwise because usually it steps outward or inward depending on the applied stresses or the residual stresses. So normally you detect that predominantly with a zero degree or near zero degree technique from the top and then back it up with an angle beam phase rate technique from the side. If it's vertical or near vertical cracking, such as your mechanical, thermal fatigue, stress corrosion, et cetera, that's where your angle beam uh, sectorial shear wave scans are most preferred. All right, the last part, and sorry to run over, I'm gonna make, I won't go through this, I'll try to run through this as fast as possible. Uh, as far as comparisons, uh, we started this because we had yeah, there'd be situations where something had been radiographed and then they'd want somebody with phase array to come back and prove that up. Or something had been phase array tested and they'd bring radiography in to prove it up. And then they wonder, well, why are they not giving me the same information? And it's because they're apples and oranges. Radiography, again, is a density-based technique. So theory tells us that there has to be some density loss, such as you know, porosity, slag, incomplete penetration or if it's something like non-fusion or a crack it needs to be oriented to where it's parallel to the direction of radiation because that's where there's the most metal loss if it was laying on a plane or laying flat like a lamination radiography is not expected to pick it up radiography's strengths are phase rate weaknesses and phase array strengths or RT's weaknesses, so just apples and oranges. So in this, I'm going to run through, I'm going to, I'm going to highlight, and then if anybody wants any uh, further look at this, I'll be happy to uh, do it one-on-one -on -one later on if we need to. But we use computer radiography and phase array, standard techniques, didn't go all crazy. So overall, there were 13 discontinuities that we evaluated, or, or 13 known, let me put it that way that we were looking for. And don't get alarmed by the fact that CR only detected eight, and I'll explain more later. Phase rate did detect them all, but still don't get all up in arms about that either. 
So these plates were designed for ultrasonic training and testing. If they, if we had a more equal balance and things that radiography was uh, susceptible to versus what ultrasonics was susceptible to, you would see more of a balance here in those numbers. In addition, what I didn't include in the 13 was radiography also in these plates found several individual pores of porosity that phase rain was incapable of identifying. They were very small in diameter, but there were a lot of individual pores. So with that said, porosity is the least detrimental flaw of all the welding flaws. So when you look at the specific comparison, what radiography missed is what we actually expected it to miss, and I've got some images and data to prove it up. So sidewall lack of fusion, toe cracks or cracking in general, against sidewall lack of fusion, sidewall lack of fusion, and crack. It easily detected the other ones. Even though phase array detected the porosities and the slags, as you'll see when I go, I'm going to highlight some of those in particular, you'll see that it was such low amplitude, a lot of times it's going to be so low that it's not even going to yield uh, us to evaluate those discontinuities. So let's look at a few, and here's one to start with. So this is some cluster porosity. You can see it on the radiograph here. We detected it in the phase array image. Very, very weak signal. You can see it. This is a 3D that I've kind of turned into a 2D to help it make sense to you. So here's your groove weld and very faint signal. So even though it detected it, that was actually for this criteria that we used for acceptance it was below the evaluation threshold. So we know that it's detected, but we'll compare the acceptability here in just a minute. And I'm going to go through all these. So radiography will hit some cracks. Again, it depends on where the source of radiation is. This was must have been more direct over. If the source would have been, say, centered up over here, you probably wouldn't have seen it. But so we're not saying radiography can't see cracks and it can't see lack of fusion. That's just the weakness. It depends on the source placement. This is the strength of phased ray. Very high, easily seen signal. And this is at a reference level DB. And again, it's right on the toe of that weld there. Lack of sidewall fusion. We expected it to not find it. You can see it here in the phase array data. It's right there on the sidewall, there in the 2D slash 3D sketch, and easily pops out, easy to see. It should be somewhere right around in here, but, and all this CR was done by an independent operator, uh, not a Lumbro technician. If you see anything bad, it's not our fault. <laughs> but, um, but nothing there. It actually didn't detect any of the sidewall wire confusion, but it's not the operator's fault. It's just the weakness in the technology. Let's get a couple. There's another crack that I found, uh, ID toe crack. You'd probably have a hard time guessing that was a crack based on the image, but it did detect it. And then if you see it here, there's where it detected it. And here's your 2D, 3D sketch. So it's right on the toe of that one. Here's a crack that radiography missed. Um, should be roughly in this area right in here, but nothing pops out. Again, that's the strength of UT. Another lack of sidewall fusion. See it there, there, nothing. Slag. There's another one radiography is really sensitive to. Easy pops out of nowhere. And we see it. That's it right here, just above my circle. There and there, but just like the porosity earlier, that one's so low in amplitude, we wouldn't evaluate it. Another lack of fusion missed, but detected right there on the sidewall. And another crack, close to porosity, same thing, low amplitude signal, even though we detected it, I have a hard time doing that with an ultrasonic technique. All right, so again, sorry to skip through for time purposes, I'm a little long-winded today, I do apologize. 
So trying to make sure, hopefully get you as much information as I can here. So a couple more things real quick. So in summary, everything kind of held true to theory, right? Uh, we, even though it, phase rate detected the slag and porosity, it rarely crossed the evaluation threshold. And then our highest sensitivity was to cracks, in, you know, lack of sidewall fusion, uh, especially anything connected to the surface. And then our RT computed was detected all the volumetric flaws with ease and some of the cracks, but missed all the sidewall lack of fusion. And as I noted earlier, it did detect some pores, even though I didn't put them in here, because I don't have any phase rate data to compare them. So quick acceptability, and all I really want to point out here is, number one, don't get alarmed by all the red on the phase rate side and all the green on the RT side. Again, these plates were built for ultrasonics. But I want to highlight a couple just to show you that even not only in detectability is it apples and oranges, but even in acceptability, it's apples and oranges. So in the case, the first one here, lack of sidewall fusion, well, radiography didn't even detect it. So if you tried to prove what phase rate found out with radiography, the RT technician is probably going to say, I don't see anything, and then who do you believe, right? you got to understand the technique and, and what it's sensitive to. In the same way, down here at the bottom, cluster porosity. Well, the RT rejected it based on length to this code. And I just did 11 and 4 for time state. But it's going to be the same in different codes. You're going to have variations in, in acceptance criteria, and you're going to have cases to where it's going to pass one, fail another. And then sometimes it lines up, such as the has crack. So rejected due to type, rejected due to type and height. And so it lines up sometimes, but not all the time. And again, cluster porosity was rejected here, not evaluated in phase array. Incomplete refusion was rejected in phase array, but accepted in CR. So again, there's going to be differences and that's the key point that I want to make sure that everybody understands. So again, like I said, apples and oranges with detectability, also acceptability. And the, the acceptance comparison is going to vary greatly with the criteria that's applied. You know, we listed all the fabrication codes before and they're all different and what's good and what's bad. And just as in before, phase rate is going to be more likely to reject cracks and lack of fusion in your standard single double B welds, really just about any common weld type. And it's going to be more likely to accept slag and porosity, where it's the opposite with radiography. All right. So with that said, uh, if anybody has any questions, I want to open it up. There should be a questions tab, should be a chat tab. Feel free to use either one. I'll give you a minute or two in case anything comes to mind. If you prefer to contact me directly with questions, feel free to contact myself. Most of you, I think, have uh, Sabrina Coleman's email address. Feel free to contact her uh, if we can help you in any manner we will be happy to all right i don't see anything coming through so again i leave my contact information up um, if, if you do have questions now in the future if issues come up uh, you need a help in hand whatever it may be obviously if you need inspection needs we'll be happy to help you out in any manner we can but I greatly appreciate everybody's time and thank you for joining us today. And we look forward to having you again here in the near future. Hope everyone has a blessed day and we'll talk with you soon, hopefully.